All right, welcome back. We are on part nine. Where did the Book of Mormon come from? So we want to give some attention to this matter. Now, as we have been looking at our timeline, we saw that there were several people who had given eyewitness testimony over across the years. We looked at the ones uh, primarily uh, in Conway, Ohio, and the family witnesses and so forth. Um, so we were, you know, we were looking at all these eyewitness statements, but it's important for us to also. Um, I want to look at the. Sorry, let me go just back a little bit here. I want to look at ones that were uh, given either by second hand, because I think that's very important that we look at those. So we're going to look at Cephas Dodd and what he said. So he says. Colonel T. Ringland, dear sir, it's been some time since I received your letter, but owing to bad health and other circumstances, I have not been able to reply until now. I have no knowledge on the subject which would be of any avail. Solomon Spalding came to Amity with his wife and a little daughter. About 1814, as near as I can recollect, he was accompanied by a certain Robert Collins, who was a bachelor, and from some of the eastern states. They had a little property, rented a tavern stand, kept a public house. After some months, Collins left for parts unknown. He so represented himself, but it was reported that he had left a wife in New England. Mr. and Mrs. Spalding usually attended church one part of the day. I understood from him that he had formerly lived in Cherry Valley in the state of New York, where he had met with some losses and had then removed to Western Reserve, where he had erected an iron works and failed. Being one day in Amity, I noticed that Reddit McKee, then a lad employed in keeping store for Mr. Jelly, was reading Virgil. Our inquiring who was his teacher, he said, Mr. Spalding. So it appeared that he had some knowledge of Latin. He afterwards read to me at different times some short pieces, which he proposed to send for publication to the county newspaper, but I believe none of them, if sent, were ever published. With me, he always seemed shy and reserved about his former history. Understanding that he had lived at Cherry Valley, I endeavored to draw him out by inquiring about Dr. Knott, he only said that Dr. Knott had used him uh, very ill. I think it was in October 1816 that dysentery was prevailing, and I attended Reddit McKee, who boarded with Mr. Spaulding. Calling one day, I found Mr. Spaulding quite ill and advised him to take some medicine, but he preferred taking his own way. After an absence of a few days, I was called to see him. He sometimes took my prescription, sometimes his own, or Mrs. Spaulding's, under which treatment the disease was protracted and terminated in his death. When he appeared to be sinking under his disease, I endeavored to converse closely with him, but there was the same reserve as to any disclosure of his manner of life. Some time after his death, an old Yankee man by the name of Hubble, who went about selling wooden bowls, told me that he had known him in the state of New York and had often heard him preach and also called him Esquire Spalding. It is probable that he was a Congregationalist and is likely not ordained while at Amity. Uh, as that denomination only gives licenses which expire by their own limitations as to time, so that there is no evidence of his being deposed for immorality. A few scraps of writing about mention were all that I knew anything about till some years after his death, uh, when the Mormons took their rise. Having received a letter of inquiry on the subject from some person in the state of Ohio, I found that Mr. Spalding had been more communicative to some other persons and that John Thompson and Van Seaman had read his novel or some parts of it. Seaman was then dead. I inquired of Mr. Thompson. He could not give much account of it. He said he remembered the names of Neary and Lehi, which he understood were used in the Mormon Bible. I was referred to uh, Mrs. Sarah Thompson, now Miss Day. She had read some of his writings, but not the one in question. I have understood that Mr. Spaulding had submitted his manuscript to Robert Patterson of Pittsburgh, who was connected into a printing office and bookstore with a view of having it published. And of course, that must have been before he came to Amity, as he still had it. That manuscript here, Mrs. Mrs. Spaulding went after his death to New York State, and I suppose carried the manuscript with her, and that being the neighborhood where Joseph Smith resided, it by some means fell into his hands, such I think has been the impression of Mrs. Spaulding though she knows not how he obtained it. You will thus perceive that I have no personal knowledge that would have any bearing on the subject, and as I have never seen either the manuscript or the Mormon Bible. My impression, however, is that it is 
is that it is of little consequence. I have no doubt that Spalding's Sonoma was used by Joseph Smith, but it was only used as a kind of substratum and did not contain anything of the essence of the Mormon faith. All that is contained in pretended revelation made to him and his successors and added afterwards. I do not suppose that any testimony that could be offered in this case would convince a Mormon of his error, and Congress will not undertake to decide as to the truth or falsehood of any religion, nor does it belong within their province. So Cephas Dodd, he was a um, he was a resident of Amity, this letter one known. And, and uh, this is uh, here George French. So he obtained secondhand testimony from Cephas Dodd. And so George French says uh, Cephas Dodd, who died January sixteenth, eighteen fifty eight, was long the pastor of the Presbyterian Church at Amity. He also practiced as a physician, and in this capacity attended Mr. Spalding in his last illness. Of his testimony, Mr. George French, now in his 83rd year residing near Amity, and whose wife was a relative of Sidney Rigdon, retains a vivid impression. Shortly after Mr. French's removal from Fayette County, Pennsylvania, to Amity in 1832, when the Mormon delusion was beginning to excite remark, Dr. Dodd took Mr. French to Spalding's grave and there told him his positive belief that Rigdon was the agent in transforming Spalding's manuscript into the Book of Mormon. The conviction thus expressed within two years after the publication of the Book of Mormon, three years before the appearance of Mr. Howe's book, which attributed the plagiarism to Rigdon, shows that Dr. Dodd's judgment was former, formed independently of any of the testimonies cited above. As to the plagiarism, it must have been based on his own knowledge of Spalding's romance and comparing it with the Book of Mormon. And as to the agent, his attention, like Mr. Miller's, may first have been directed to Rigdon by Spalding himself. Mr. French has no personal knowledge of Rigdon's connection with the printing office. Mr. Editor, I was reading quite lately in the papers the oft-repeated story of their origin of the Book of Mormon. I have long believed that it was substantially true. It said it, said it was written by one Solomon Spalding, disabled or retired congregational minister as a sort of romance found on the evidence afforded that our country has once been inhabited by a race of people more civilized and distinct from the Indian tribes found on its discovery by Columbus, it being a popular theory about that time. These were the lost tribes of Israel and the probable mound builders. This manuscript is said either before or after Mr. Spalding's death was taken to a printing office at Pittsburgh, where Sidney Rigdon got hold of it and with Joseph Smith and others published it as found in a miraculous manner in Palmyra, New York. This Mr. Spalding is said lived at an early day at Conuit and had a forge or trip hammer in the valley on the creek. This was confirmed to the present writer some years ago by the late Colonel Robert Harper of Harpersfield. He said when a young man he spent uh, some time at Conuit well remembered Mr. Spalding and his wife, he spoke of him as somewhat singular, living in a long, low, shanty-like building of boards. In one end was his forge, while on the other he lived with his wife, he kept a kind of grocery store. He said in common with other young men, he often spent his evenings there. He distinctly remembered one night they had been playing cards for amusement. When about to leave, he needed something to wrap up his cards, when Mrs. Spalding brought to him a leaf of some manuscript. Upon making some remark about the propriety of his using it, she remarked that it was only a piece of of the doctor's novel. This led him to ask if her husband was writing a novel, and when she said yes, upon the first inhabitants who lived upon this continent. And upon examination, he found this to be the character of the scrap of the manuscript she had given him. All this in connection with what had been published before and the fact of such remarkable remains in the neighborhood of Conuit leads to the probable conclusion that Solomon Spalding wrote the Book of Mormon, in substance at least, and probably while living at Conuit. I have, been, I have written in the hope that there were persons still living at Conuit or in the vicinity that know, knew Mr. Spalding who can confirm the above, and more than this can affirm they knew Mr. Spalding to be the author of the book, such as it is. If there are any such persons, I think it would be promotive of the truth to publish it. At least it would serve to preserve and establish a historical fact. Therefore, I am prompted to ask, that all such communications shall appear in your columns or in the Conuit paper, from which no doubt you would cheerfully copy, hoping that both the editor of the Telegraph and Conuit reporter will feel an interest in the matter. I am yours truly.
H. Hollis, Greencastle, Indiana. So even though this is secondhand testimony, it might show that Spalding had laid aside his first manuscript because, I mean, he allowed someone to use that paper from the manuscript, which makes sense if it was one that he was no longer working on, right? And he began working on a second manuscript in Conuit. So we got Cephas Dodd, then we got Robert Hopper, uh, secondhand through Hollis, and then we have Daniel Spencer. So you want to see what he has to say? So a correspondent of the Ashtabula Telegraph writing from Greencastle, Indiana, says in support of the belief that one Solomon Spalding, who once lived in Conuit, was the author of the Book of Mormon, that the late Colonel Robert Harper, when a young man, was frequently at the said Spalding's in Conuit, that Harper told him, the correspondent, that he, Harper, had seen a page of manuscript admitted by Spalding's wife to have been written by him, remarking farther uh, that her husband was engaged upon a novel, subject of which was the first inhabitants of this continent, the correspondent seeks farther information upon this subject. Not long after the appearance of the Book of Mormon, Dr. Daniel M. Spencer, a resident of Kingsville, in a conversation we're hearing at our father's house in this town, said that he was well acquainted with Spalding when he lived in Conuit, had been at his house often and had read manuscripts uh, written by Spalding. But the matter contained in said manuscripts was touching the lost tribes of Israel, their wanderings and final sentiments on this continent, they saw and read the pages of Spalding's fanciful writings at different times and read much of them. He declared not only the subject matter uh, of Spalding's novel was incorporated in the Book of Mormon, but much of it was a literal transcript to the best of his knowledge after reading the contents of both. His declarations were made when Mormonism first made it monstrous pretensions when the public mind was stirred upon the subject, and they made a very formidable impression upon our mind. Dr. Spencer had a decided taste for antiquarian research and speculation, and those who knew him will not wonder that he was interested in Spalding's vagaries about, vagaries about the Lost Tribes, Mound Builders. As the correspondent suggests, some of the older citizens of Conuit must have some knowledge upon this subject not yet made public. So I'll go a little bit further. And what was Daniel Spencer? And then we got William Leffingwell in 1885. So he says, the, current, the venerable Leffingwell, accompanied by an old Mormon friend from Utah, was met by a Republican reporter yesterday afternoon on Olive Street. Colonel's friend remarked to the reporter, did you know that Leffingwell corrected the manuscript of the Mormon Bible alleged to have been written by Reverend Solomon, Solomon Spalding? It was something like a new revelation on Colonel Leffingwell stating that it was a fact, and as all parties know in the circumstances are now dead, except Mr. Leffingwell, he was asked to add to the truth of history by telling what he knew about the origin of the Mormon Bible. Colonel readily consented that but his Mormon friend, observing his readiness to do so, walked on and beckoned to the colonel to come along, evidently objecting to having the story told for publication. Colonel Leffingwell commenced by saying, Long ago in the past, I have forgotten this the year, Mr. Spalding wrote a drama called The Book of Mormon in a hotel at Conuit, Ashtabula County, Ohio, where I had been teaching school. I was known throughout the country as a good grammarian and possessing an accurate knowledge of the English language. My father had been principal of the Meadville School at Meadville, Pennsylvania for eight years, a position which I subsequently filled on my father retiring to a farm. Mr. Spalding was a lawyer by profession and had taught school. He had never been a reverend, as some accounts given that prefix to his name. I believe he's wrong on that account, about that detail. He was about 35 years of age when I first fell in with him, was very poor and sick with consumption, and toward the last... Last year, he lost his voice so that he could not plead at the bar. He said he wanted to make some money and wrote the drama which he had handed me for correction. It was full of Bible expressions. And as I read the Bible from lid to lid, I knew the proper phraseology to use. I corrected the grammar and had to reconstruct and transpose entries to make good English out of it. I was engaged three months, and my notes and pencil marks may be found on every page. Now, of course, uh, when he said Bible expressions, of course, you know, he's wanting to write in the style of the King James Version. It's most likely what he means there. Never paid for it. He, uh, was is the title 
on the next section. He wanted to conform to Bible language. He never paid me a cent for my labor. It was entitled the Book of Mormon. I think he's wrong on that count too. And he told me he was going to Pittsburgh to sell the manuscript. I afterwards learned that he got hold of Sidney Rigdon, and I knew within six months that Spalding sold it and that Rigdon got it. Now, I don't know. He's mixed up on that detail, too. Rigdon was a preacher in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and I believe he gets that detail wrong, too. He was a scholar and a smart fellow. I had seen him baptizing converts in Mahoning County, Ohio. Some years after I was on a lecture tour in Ohio, lecturing on grammar and construction of English language, I went to Kirtland in a buggy accompanied by a young lawyer to see Joe Smith and the Mormon leaders. We drove up in front of a large tent, and Sidney Rigdon came out. I told him that I corrected the Mormon Bible when it was Spalding's manuscript. I assured that I gave him I gave it the proper construction and what grammar it had. He smiled and said that it was all right, but requested me to say nothing about it. I told Rigdon that we came over there to see him and Joe Smith. He said, it's just our dinner time. You can't see Joe Smith because he is marking uh, goods at the store. They had received 40 wagon loads from the lakeshore the day before. Afterwards, we were introduced to the prophet. Joseph Smith had a round face. His hair was cut short down on his forehead. The color of his hair was between a deep brown and dark red. He sent a young man with us into the temple, which was but newly finished. The front had a projecting roof supported by pillars. We entered the portico when the young man, our guide, said, Take off your hats. I replied, our hats are already off, sir. We're a, we have a long way to drive, and we want, want you to hurry up, sir. We then we were then conducted into the interior of the temple. Broad aisle ran through the middle of the temple with a cross aisle in the center, above which a curtain hung, dividing the temple into two parts. Senior Rigdon and Occupy, we were towed the eastern portion, and Joe Smith the western portion which included the grand altar. The arrangement seemed to be thus made in the consequence of the incomplete conditions of the temple. By mounting on one's shoulders, we were enabled to pull ourselves up through the hole in the attic where we were shown several mummies, including that of Joseph and other patriarchs mentioned in the Bible. After visiting the temple, we were invited into the tent where we were provided with a good dinner, and taking leave of the saints, we drove out of Kirtland well satisfied with our visit. The above chat with Leffingwell left the impression that his statements of the part taken by him in the correction of Spalding's manuscript is undeniable, but the other fact that said manuscript was the original of the Mormon Bible is rather a matter of inference than supported by direct and inconvertible testimony. Colonel Leffingwell, however, asserts that so far as he has compared his recollection of the Spalding manuscript with the Mormon Bible, they are identical. That is his belief. Broadhurst notes, uh, I think he made some good points here, that L. L. Rice recalled Leffingwell as being a well-known teacher in northern Ohio in March 4, 1886 letter to the Honolulu newspaper. And if Leffingwell did assist in, at a hotel in Kiowa, then it must have been at Henry Lake's Mansion's house, which most likely dates to the second half of 1812. Three, his memory does not serve him well in the layout of the Kirtland Temple, Smith's appearance, Rigdon's connections to the Presbyterians. We must be careful with this testimony, and I agree with him on that, on that matter. It seems like a very strong case with all the witnesses that have been shown thus far. We want to be fair, though, and present what seems to be contradictory and are weak witnesses. This would be kind of like a, you know, when the defense gives an objection. And so we want to show those. So Daniel Spaulding, maybe from 1807 to 1892, the son of John Spaulding. This is what he wrote. So he was asked questions in an interview. What is your given name, Mr. Spaulding? Daniel Spaulding. How old are you? I'm 82 years old. How long have you been lived in this vicinity? About 60 years. How closely were you related to Solomon Spalding? He was my father's brother. How old were you the last time you saw your uncle? Between 10 and 11 years of age. Then, you remember him well? Oh yes, he was a very sickly man, and the last time I saw him was at Conuit Creek just before he went to Pittsburgh, where he died shortly afterwards. 
What did your uncle do for a living? He was a land agent, and my father said he was a scoundrel and used to cheat the people out of their money and property. Was he much of a scholar? No, he had much some natural talent, but he was not very smart, but very lazy. Then he wrote the manuscripts that the Mormons called the Book of Mormon to make money out of it. How did the Mormons get the manuscripts? I don't know. Here his daughter lay about 50 years replied. His widow gave them to Joseph Smith Jr. Is there not a story afloat that Sidney Reardon stole them? I had not heard that before. Responded, did you ever see the manuscripts or the Book of Mormon? No. What did Mr. Spalding write about? I heard my father say it was a story about the Indians. Was your uncle a minister? He was not, neither did he belong to any church. Then you do not know whether the Book of Mormon and the manuscript are the same or not. No, only what I have heard people say have not seen either. Now, there's some weaknesses of this testimony that we want to point out, as I think Broadhurst brought out. The last time he saw his uncle, he said he was between 10 and 11 years of age, which would be in 1817. Spalding died in 1816. Uh, number two, he says he saw him just before he went to Pittsburgh, which would make it 1812, which would make him around five years old. About a five-year-old could remember something like that at a very young age. And there's Josiah Spalding, another brother of Solomon Spalding, and this is what his testimony of which he gave. He says, Sir, I received your letter of the 21st of December requesting me to give you a sketch of my brother Solomon's life. I should be pleased to oblige the satisfactory, but my recollection and faculty of mind is so much impaired with age and infirmity, being within two months of 90 years of age. I can give but a broken narrative. He was born 1761 in the first part of the Revolutionary War. He was in the army or at work on the farm. I do not recollect when he commenced study for education at high school, nor how long he continued there, but when he left there, he went to study with the celebrated Zephaniah Swift to prepare for the practice of law. How long he studied with him, I do not recollect. But before he got through, his mind changed from law to gospel, and he left and went to college. But when I do not recollect, I believe he was in college about three years. He did not study theology at any public school after he left college. When he left college, he was out of health and was so for years. He was approbated to preach as a Congregationalist, followed that calling a number of years, but never settled on account of his health, though often urged. In 1795, he married. I went to Cherry Valley and commenced merchandising. I had no wife. He followed soon after with his wife and joined me in partnership. He left the store to my care, took the charge of an academy, preached occasionally for a while. We continued in Cherry Valley about four years, and then we moved our store 16 miles to Richfield. We soon after went into a large speculation in new land. In Pennsylvania and Ohio, and after a few years, he moved out there with his wife. She never had any children. She sold a large amount of land on credit, principally to people in Ohio. The war that broke out with England seriously affected that country. That circumstance with some others, other misfortunes that happened placed us in difficult circumstances. We were under the necessity to make great sacrifices to pay our debts. I went to see my brother and stayed with him some time. I found him unwell and somewhat low in spirits. He began to compose his novel, which is a conjecture that the Mormons made use of in forming their Bible. Indeed, although there was nothing in of it in it of Mormonism or that favored error in any way, yet I am apprehensive that they took pattern from it in forming their delusion. You may find reason in what follows. In the town where he lived, which I expect is now called Salem, Ohio, there is the appearance of an ancient fort nearby a large mound which, when opened, was found to contain human bones. These things gave it the appearance of it being inhabited by civilized people. These appearances furnished a topic of conversation among the people. My brother told me that a young man told him that he had a wonderful dream. He dreamed that he himself, if I recollect right, opened a great mound where there were human bones. There he found a written history that would answer the inquiry respecting the civilized people that once inhabited that country until they were destroyed by the savages. This story suggested the idea of writing a novel merely for amusement. The title of his novel, I think, was Historical Novel or Manuscript Found. This novel is the history contained in the manuscript found. The author of it he brings from the old world, but from what nation I do not recollect. I think not a Jew, nor do I recollect how long since, but I think before the Christian era. He was a man of superior learning suited to that day. He went to sea, lost his point of compass, and finally landed on the American shore, I think near the mouth of the Mississippi River. 
There he reflects most feelingly on what he suffered, his present condition, and future prospects. He likewise made some lengthy remarks on astronomy and philosophy, which I should think would agree in sentiment and style with very ancient writings. He soon after moved to Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, where he lived a while and then moved farther to a place where he died. His widow then returned to the state of New York, lived there a while, and then came to Connecticut. She informed me, if I recollect right, that my brother continued his history of the civilized nation and the progress of the war until the triumph of the savages to the destruction of the civilized government. Likewise, she informed me that soon after they arrived at Pittsburgh, a man followed them. I do not recollect his name, but he was afterwards known to be a leading Mormon. He got into the employment of a printer and told the printer about my brother's composition. The printer called and requested the privilege of taking it home to read. He and my brother let him take it. He kept it some time, and then he urged him, my brother to let him print it. He and my brother would not consent, but took it back, and she said that she brought it to New York, put it into a chest where she lived, and at that time when she was from home, a stranger called upon her and requested her to let him see the novel that her husband composed. He said that he lived at the West, and it was reported there that it gave rise to Mormonism. If not true, he wished to counteract the report. She told him that he might go to the house. It was in a chest. He might take it and examine it. He went to the chest, and I think she told me, he had said he could not find it, but it has never been found since. But what use could they make of it? I never saw the Mormon Bible but once, and then only for a minute. No time to examine it. I have but little knowledge of Mormonism. I have been out of the way of it. You, sir, no doubt have more knowledge. But if I have been rightly informed, there is a striking resemblance between the first start and introduction of the Mormon Bible and my brother's novel. They both claim that the manuscripts from which they pretend they copied were a very ancient date and were written by men that came here from the old world. The Mormon Bible was not published until after my brother's death. Yours respectfully, Josiah Spaulding. It seems to be clear uh, that Josiah was familiar with the first manuscript that he composed, manuscript story. And we see that he gets some details mixed up. Robert Patterson Sr., he also, remember, was the one who was the publisher, uh, who was going to be the publisher of the book. Robert Patterson had in his employment Silas Ingalls at the time, a foreman printer and general superintendent of the printing business. As he, Silas Ingalls, was an excellent scholar as well as good printer, to him was entrusted entire concerns of the office. He even decided on the propriety or otherwise of publishing of manuscripts when offered as to their morality, scholarship, in this character, he informed Robert Patterson that a gentleman from the East originally had put into his hands a manuscript of a singular work, chiefly in the style of our English translation of the Bible, and handed the copy to Robert Patterson, who read only a few pages, finding nothing apparently exceptional. He, Robert Patterson, said to Ingalls he might publish it if the author furnished the funds on, or good security. He, the author, fell in to comply with the terms. Mr. Ingalls returned the manuscript, as I suppose at that time, after it had been some weeks in his possession with other manuscripts in the office. This communication written and signed, 1842, Robert Patterson. So you can see there, that that's why it's possible that, um, remember it was R.J. Patterson? And um, it, it seems to be pretty clear from this testimony that it highly likely that uh, Solomon Spalding dealt more with the brother, um, Joseph Patterson, and Silas Ingalls more than he did with Robert Patterson. William Small While I was living in Pittsburgh in 1841 at the time, so much was said of the Book of Mormon and in connection with the Solomon Spalding story. It was start, stated that the Spalding manuscript was placed in Mr. Patterson's hands for publication and that Sidney Rigdon was connected with him at the time. In connection with John E. Page, I called upon General Patterson, the publisher, and asked him the following questions, and received his replies as given. Question, did Sidney Rigdon have any connection with your office at the time you had the Solomon Spalding manuscript? No. Did Sidney Rigdon obtain the Spalding story at that office? No. He also stated to us that the Solomon Spalding manuscript was brought to him by the widow of Solomon Spalding, 
to be published, and that she offered to give him half the profits for his pay if he would publish it. But after it had laid there for some time, after he had due time to consider it, he determined not to publish it. She then came and received the manuscript from his hands and took it away. She also stated that Sidney Rigdon was not connected with the office for several years afterwards. Junior Patterson also made affidavit to the above statement. So we can see there, there's a lot, um, you know, it's hard to uncover what actually happened with this manuscript. Um, there's a lot of conflicting accounts of it. So we've got to keep on exploring it a little bit further. So join me next time as we explore more in the upcoming video.